Dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can um, come together, Lord, to look into this chapter of Daniel and learn more about the 70 weeks. But before we do, Lord, we invite your presence to be with us. Lord, we ask and pray that your Holy Spirit will be amongst us. I pray, Lord God, that you will speak through me. Lord, I am a person that is not eloquent in English. Uh, I mean, it is my second language, but Father in heaven, I pray that you will speak through me, that the words that I speak, may they, the people here, may your people understand what I'm sharing. Thank you, Father in heaven, for all that you've done and your guidance in the week. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we get started. You know, when it comes to the book of Daniel, you know, there have been so many great interests when it, came to this, um, when it comes to this particular chapter. Many Christians have studied it. You know, many Christians have studied this chapter and have been immersed by the prophetic message that is found in here. One such person that comes to mind, one such person that was impressed by the prophetic message, do you know who that, might, who, who that is? Does anyone have a clue? Huh? Peter? Miller, who's Miller? Oh, William Miller, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, William. Someone before that, someone before that. And there's a person by the name of Isaac Newton. Did you guys know that? Isaac Newton wrote more on theology, on biblical prophecy, than he wrote on mathematics and physics. I mean, this is the father of physics. Do you know that? He came up with all the various laws. I don't know the laws. I didn't even do physics. I'm terrible when it comes to physics. I know when I push something, it reacts. That's all I know. And that's, I, I've, I've been in computers. That's all I know. When I press a button, it should work. That's all I know. But he wrote a book. Isaac Newton wrote a book called The Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John. And he states here in page 15 that the predictions of things to come relate to the state of the church in all ages. And... Amongst the old prophets, Daniel is most distinct in order of time and easiest to be understood. How many of us agree with that? Yeah? Obviously, from a guy who founded physics, it's easy for him to say it is easy to be understood. But it is indeed easy. He goes on. And therefore, in those things which relate to the last times, he must be made the key to the rest. What an amazing statement from the father of physics, all right? He states that the book of Daniel is easiest to understand. How many of us can agree to that? One or two hands. Well, it, it kind of is, if you ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you, of course, right? So how amazing is that? This, the father of physics, believes that the book of Daniel, this 18th century physicist, says that the book of Daniel is important, especially in these last days. Then I believe, for us, I believe as Christians, we should take seriously this book, right? This book of Daniel, especially as we are living in these last days. How well, for all of us, how well do we understand a prophetic message that is found in Daniel, and especially in Daniel chapter 9? How well do we understand Daniel? Well, let's get a... Let a quick introduction to uh, the book of Daniel. Before we go any further into this particular rabbit hole, in understanding this uh, 70 weeks, there are some important key elements that we need to kind of um, consider before we progress. Do you understand that? There's some things that we need to, to kind, of, kind of lay out. The first thing is, when was Daniel chapter 9 written? Does anyone have a clue? Was, was it straight after Daniel 8? Like Daniel 8, he had the vision about the 2,300 day prophecy. And then it was like, oh, okay, let me pray. And then the next day he woke up and God, uh, and, and God spoke to him. Was that how it is? Well, either way, we're given a clue anyway. Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. What does it say there? The first year of who? Darius. Darius. Yes, Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, and so on and so forth. Darius the Mede, correct? Now, the first year of his reign, obviously, would have been the, the he, he, um, Darius would have conquered the, um, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, removed them, moved uh, King Belshazzar, and set up his kingdom, right? His first year of reign, that came to 539 B.C., okay? His first year, Darius the Mede, 539 B.C. 
Now, what is interesting, what I kind of figured out, was Daniel chapter 8. When was that written? Does anyone know when Daniel 8 was written? But pardon? 550? Well, we are given, of course, Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. The third year, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. And we all know who King Belshazzar is, right? Last week, we've gone through that. King Belshazzar, uh, he, well, scholars have suggested that Daniel 8 would have been written at 548 to 547 BC. His third year, that is. So that, let me give you an idea. That is about, what, nine to ten years difference in a and apart. Do you guys understand that? Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, there is 9 to 10 years differences in that. Okay? We understand that in Daniel 7, or oh, Daniel 7 is the start when, uh, where Daniel started receiving more prophetic messages. Do you understand? More prophetic message. Before he used to just interpret the visions. Now he's receiving the visions of what is to come. Does that make sense? And we find that in Daniel chapter 7, where he received the visions of the animals, the four beasts. Before that, it was just interpretations of King Nebuchadnezzar's visions. And now he's getting a, God is speaking to him, directly to him. And that starts when King Belshazzar starts taking leadership, when, when King Belshazzar, of course, uh, starts reigning, which, which um, kind of gives you an idea that uh, King Belshazzar was a, the time of the big, uh, or the time of the beginning of their end, kind of. And as I said, I used to think that Daniel eight and Daniel nine used to be kind of side by side. There was no t particular gap, but there was a nine to ten year difference. And I want you guys to put that in the in the side of you know just to think about that. Now I want us to realize what brought about this event that we find in Daniel chapter nine. What brought this whole thing? Well. We got to understand where Daniel was uh, kind of, you know, obviously he was curious to know what's going on, what's this 2,300-day 200, no, prophecy. So for Daniel, he studied the book. He studied, he studied the, the scriptures. And you find there in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, that he understood the books, the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, who? The prophet, right? Now, what prophecy was Daniel referring to? What is this uh, prophecy that Jeremiah kind of referred? Does anyone know what it was? 70 weeks. Was it 70 weeks? It was 70 days, right? 70 days. It was 70-year prophecy in some way. All right? So we find in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses, uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 to 12, we find the prophecy relating to the Israelites that they will be taken where? They will be taken to Babylon. And there they will be in Babylon or in captivity for how many years? 70 years. And it tells us that after the end of the 70 years that God will punish the king of Babylon. Remember that. God will punish the king of Babylon after the 70 years and the nation of the Chaldeans and of their iniquity. And the promise is also there in uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. He says that after the 70 years are completed at Babylon... What would he do? What would God do? He will visit them and they can return back to the home. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Isn't that great? That's the same thing like us, that Jesus is going to come again and we're going to be home with him. Isn't that awesome? That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful, of course, a uh, beautiful promise that God has given us. So when the 70 years, according to Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12, when the 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and th that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity. Did God punish the, the king of Babylon? Yes. And right now in Daniel chapter 9, who is the king at that present time? Ooh. It, it's the rice, right? The rice, the mead, right? The rice, the mead. So we find Daniel 9 starts at uh, the reign of the rice mead at 539 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed by the, um, destroyed, okay. Sorry, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, all right. So that gives us an idea when the 70 year, Jeremiah 70 year prophecy begins, right? So when do you reckon that should end? 70 years, so 70, 586 minus what? 
70, which will make it into 516 BC, right? But yet, for some reason, Daniel is still in Babylon. The king, I mean, it's 539 BC. Well, of course, for him, he wouldn't have a clue, but it's 539 BC. There's a bit of a discrepancy. Do you know what I mean? And hence the reason why, when we think about Daniel, he's, he's studying the scriptures, he's trying to figure out what's going on. Seventy weeks? There's how many years is left for, for, for the Jews to return, for the Israelites to return back to their home, according to the prophecy? So 539, we understand that in, of course, they should be back by around maybe 516, 516 BC. It's about 20 years, right? 20, so 20 plus years, there's a, or 30 plus years until the end of Jeremiah's prophecy. Is that correct? There should be. <laughs> so Daniel, of course, is curious what's going on. The, the king of Babylon is gone, but is it ahead of schedule? What's going on? <laughs> it doesn't make, <laughs> hence the reason why Daniel was, again, studying the, the scriptures, studying the book of Jeremiah, figuring out what's going on. His people, he was thinking about his people. He's thinking about what's going on. Uh, are we still in captivity? under this new leadership? Or are we, are we free to go do anything that we want? Lord, what's going on? And like anything, when it comes to questions about God's divine plan, what do we do? What should we do? We should pray, indeed. Daniel prays. Daniel chapter nine verse three, three tells us that he faced towards God, faced towards Jerusalem. And he made his request, his supplications with fasting, with sackcloth, and with ashes. Now, I want you to understand, you know, when it comes to us, we need to have that type of, I'm not asking you to get a, a sackcloth or ashes on your head, but at least think about it. How sincere are your prayers when we think about Daniel's prayer? How sincere are we? Do we fast? Do we fast for our people? We fast for our people. But again, let me ask you something. If you knew that your people were going to be coming back home, isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? I'm reminded of this one verse. It's also a song that we used to sing when I was young. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 11. So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to what? Zion with singing, right? With everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, sorrow and sigh shall flee away. So if this verse should encourage Daniel to be happy and be delighted, 70 years, it's only about 20 more years left, right? We should be happy because we're going home. We're going home. We're going to go back to my old neighborhood. Hopefully it's still there. I'm going to go back to my neighborhood where I had... You know, I'm going to be there by the presence of God at the Holy Temple. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But yet here he is coming to the Lord with sackcloth and ashes. What does sackcloth and ashes mean? Mourning. But the verse tells us that they should be coming back home with joy and gladness and sorrow. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Why? And I want you to think about us as well as Seventh-day Adventists. Jesus is coming back soon. Do we believe that? But how many of us are in a position like Daniel? Are, uh, is there a people that is ready for his soon return? And that's pretty much it. When we think about the sackcloth and ashes, then it's, mean, it's meant to signify a, a mourning of, of repentance, of, of, of abasement, of humility before God. How many of us are praying for those lost souls out there that need to know the gospel, that need to know the everlasting gospel? We as Seventh-day Adventists that hold it, that know the truth, that know that we're going to be coming home soon. How many of us are there on our knees praying, Lord, just like Desmond Doss, help me save one person, just one person, that they may enter into that pearl, through the pearly gates and meet you. How many of us are like that? Something that we need to remember. You see, um, Daniel, Daniel had 
a heavy heart for his people. Daniel had a very heavy heart for his people. Daniel knows that his people are a stiff-necked people. Daniel knows that his people were unfaithful. He asked the Lord to forgive them. He asked the Lord to forgive them of their sins and, and to turn away his fury from his chosen people. In a book, uh, Sanctified Life, it says here, the man of God was praying for the blessing of heaven upon his people and for a clearer knowledge of his divine will. The burden of his heart was for Israel, who were not, in the strictest sense, keeping the law of God. He acknowledges that all their the misfortunes have come upon them in consequence of the transgression of the Holy Law. Now, what is our reaction for our own people and for those people out there? Something for us to ponder. Something for us indeed to ponder. Now, let's get straight to the meat, okay? The meat, the whole point we're here. My, the title of my message is 70 Weeks Prophecy, okay? Here, after Daniel is praying, who comes to his aid to help him better understand? Gabriel. The angel Gabriel comes, okay? Angel Gabriel comes and he reveals to Daniel near to the end I mean, well, near to the end of his prayer, what is to come. Now, a little thing, another thing to also note, that this concept of this seven year comes kind of after, sorry, this, this concept of this 70 weeks comes after Jeremiah's 70 year, uh, 70 year prophecy. So it kind of gives you an idea, does it like this concept of 70, 70s. But anyway, we'll, no need to go through that. But uh, something very important comes, of course, now Daniel is being visited by the angel Gabriel. We find here in um, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the, the, the prophecy. Now, because of time, actually, I do have a lot of time. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, I'll, just go through the, I'll just go through this verse. Please, I will try. I will try. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the tr uh, to transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right. We've all, for most of us, kind of gone through all this. We, we understand what this is. But for those who aren't, aren't, you know, stick with me, stay with me. We also got extra studies. Pastor Barron has uh, extra Bible studies on these particular topics. For those who don't understand what I'm saying, you can probably help. Hopefully he can probably explain it better than me. Um, but here we have the first part of the 70-week prophecy. Verse 24 reveals to us that a time, a time has been determined on or, or decreed on the Israelites, right? 70 weeks are given to the Israelites to what? To do what? To finish transgressions, yeah, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision, and prophecy, and to what? Anoint the most holy. All right? Of course, 70 weeks when we convert them into days, 70 times 7, we're not, come on, let's do, do a bit of maths here. 70 times 7 is? 490 days. And understanding a day, according to Bible prophecy, is? A year, indeed. Okay? So, I, I don't know if I'm treating you like children. So, it's something that I have to learn as I'm bringing up my child in this world as well. But how is this verse, how is this, how is verse 23 connected with uh, the Daniel chapter 8, verse 13 or 14 regarding the 2,300 day prophecy? Okay. How is that, how is that, how is, what is the connection? Well, in Aramaic, in Aramaic, the word determined or decreed in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 is said to only exist nowhere in the Bible, except for this one verse, net, netak, is in its basic meaning, means to cut off from something longer. Does that make sense? Netak means to cut off something that is longer. Do you get that? What was longer? Yeah, 2000, 2000, yes, exactly. The logical line of thought was that the 490 years is a cutoff from the 2,300 year prophecy. Does that make sense? Now that's all the Hebrew I'm gonna go through, or the Aramaic that I'll be going through. <laughs> so with that line of thought, 
The Israelites had 490 years to set themselves right with God. But this period is cut off and determined for them. Does it make sense? Yeah? Cool. Now, I think the main question, therefore, would be is this. When does this 2,300-year prophecy or 490-year prophecy begin? And the answer, of course, would be found in the next verse, in verse 25. Here we are, verse 25. Now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, Messiah the Prince, there shall be, what? Seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be rebuilt, um, shall be built again, and the walls even in troublesome times. Okay. Here we have a starting point, and that is the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, have you, you have to remember, was Jerusalem in ruins at this present time? Yeah, Jerusalem has been in ruins for about 40 plus years. 40 plus years after the Babylonians destroyed it. Now, Babylon right now, under, uh, with Daniel present, of course, that Babylon is under new management, all right? And um, there are three decrees will be issued dealing with the uh, repatriation of the, Jewish, uh, of the Jews, and it can be found in which book? Does anyone know which book can, we can find these three decrees? The book of Ezra. We've got some Bible scholars here. Praise the Lord. The book of Ezra. The first decree that we can find is in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 of 4. And it's the first decree by Cyrus, which was given in 537 BC. All right. The second decree, the second decree is found in Ezra chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. And this was given in 520 BC. The, now, you might be thinking, why doesn't, because for those who know Bible prophecy, why doesn't the decree or wasn't, well, why doesn't the time period start at this particular period? Well, these two decrees weren't in regards to the restoration and rebuilding of Jerusalem. These were in regards to the restoration and rebuilding of, does anyone know? The temple. So this was more to deal with the religious institution, the rebuilding of the religious institution, which is always important, right? It was, however, in Ezra chapter 7, verses 25 to 26, where King Artaxerxes, in his seventh year, made a decree and gave authority to Ezra to establish a civil government and giving uh, Ezra full state, or giving Israel full, or Jerusalem full state autonomy, which will be subject under, under Persian rule. The decree will establish the foundation and the restoration of Jerusalem um, as a civil state in what year? 457 BC. So the differences in the first two decree was in regards to the restoration and rebuilding of the temple. The last one, the third decree, was in regards to more civil matters in restoring and establishing a state. Does that make sense? So that gives us a bit of an understanding of the, the whole, uh, of why, of when the, uh, when the, um, this seven week prophecy begins. 457 BC. So, now, before we look further into this uh, 62 weeks and seven weeks, it's worth mentioning what the word Messiah means. What does the word Messiah mean? It's right there on the screen. To an, yeah. To anoint, correct? Now, that is to say, when we look at that particular verse, in verse uh, 25, that from the decree to restore Jerusalem, there will be a period of time. Does that make sense? From the decree, there will be a period of time until, until the time when a ruler or prince will be anointed. Does that make sense? There is a, a particular period of time. So I want you to keep this thought to the side as we look now into the 62 and 7 weeks. Now, first off, this, uh, uh, this 62 weeks and so, oh, this 62 weeks and 7 weeks, I guess like, why are they separate? Why are these, you know, why aren't they combined and joined? Now, there is, I, I looked through this, there's no significant uh, special reasons why they are separated. I'm not too sure. However, uh, they are connected with the 70 weeks. And the best way to look at it is look at 62 plus 7. 62 plus 7 is 69, right? 
69, and it's 69 weeks times it by 7, which will equal to, oh, it's right there, 4, 483 weeks, see? I got the answers for you guys. I'm a, I'm a terrible math teacher. Anyway, <laughs> so we've got a starting point at least. Now, we've got the starting point, which was what year? 457, when the, when the prophecy shall begin, right? When the prophecy will begin. So 457. So now we're going to figure out this 483 days, or 483 years, and what happens at the end of that 483 years. So we already have that starting point, okay? Uh, now we just need to make the proper, addition, uh, proper connection, which is, of course, 457 minus 483, uh, which will equal to, I guess like some people will come up with 26, but then you, there's no such thing as 0 AD. No? Has anyone heard of 0 AD? Imagine a person that was born in 0 AD. <laughs> Obviously, we plus 1, and now they come up to 27 AD, right? So what happened in 27 AD? Yes, exactly. See, we've got so many good Bible scholars. I don't even know, I don't even know why I should be up here teaching this lesson. You guys already know the answer. I should just get you guys up here. <laughs> Indeed, Jesus. Jesus was baptized. Yeah, yeah, Yeshua was baptized, and it was there. Jesus came up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descended, like him, uh, descended uh, upon him like a dove, uh, and God speaking from heaven, this is my beloved son, uh, son in whom I, I am well pleased. Okay, Jesus was anointed. Our dear Savior in his ministry was uh, anointed, and he was blessed um, through that ministry to, uh, for our salvation and to reign over all those who he has redeemed. Praise the Lord for that, right? And such. We see the completion, the fulfillment of that prophecy according to his time. Now, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, and it says, yeah, we're going to look at these two, last two chapters, uh, last two verses, 26 and 27. He says, yeah, after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and um, uh, not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end the war of desolations are determined. And it says here, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and, off uh, and offering, and on the wing of, of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. A lot of things that we need to go through here, right? So first things first, look at verse 26. He reveals to us that the 62 weeks or 300, uh, 430, sorry, 400 and, um, uh, 434 years, Jesus will be cut off. And that is to say Jesus would, will die afterwards. And of course, what happened to Jesus? He was crucified. And the temple would be destroyed. Does anyone know what year the temple was destroyed? Or when was Jerusalem sacked? 70 AD. Yeah, so 70 AD, Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed by the up-and-coming Roman emperor by the name of Titus. So verse 26 shows uh, the fulfillment of that according to God's time. But verse 27 reveals to us, tells us that uh, Jesus shall confirm a covenant with many for one week which we understand to be seven years. Good. Seven years in Bible prophecy. However, the verse adds that in the middle of the week, Jesus will bring an end to sacrifice and offer, an, offer, um, an offering. So seven divided by two is three and a half, right? So three and a half. We get, um, so when does this week begin? Well, of course, 27 AD, okay, plus three and a half which were equal to 31 AD, right? So the question, therefore, would be what happened in 31 AD? And what happens in 31 AD? Well, yes, Jesus was crucified, yeah? Here, yeah, the saddest part in human history is revealed. The saddest part, not only in human history, but in all the universe, gets to see their creator on the cross, for a tiny speck in this vastness in space. Now, we may not know it, but that's just pretty much what we are. That's who we are. Jesus 
was indeed crucified. And at Jesus' crucifixion, what did he bring an end to? The sacrifices and the offerings. We understand in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, that the veil of the temple was rent, torn in two from top to bottom, earthquake, the rock split, etc. The sanctuary service, God had, well, pretty much God had left the building. I've had enough of these rebellious people. <laughs> Not really. He just, it was, it was fulfilled. It was done. The veil was separated, the world, uh, sep uh, the, the veil that separated the world and where God resides to interact with his people was split. And God reveals to us that uh, he left the building and will no longer accept the sacrifices and offerings of his people because Jesus had paid the price. Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. Now, verse 27 also stipulates that Jesus confirmed a covenant for a week. What is that covenant that he confirmed? Next week, we're going to be kind of going through it. But yes, in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, it says here, Jesus says, oh, Luke says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The covenant that Jesus shed, or the covenant that was confirmed for a, a week, which continues on, is his blood. So I hope to see you guys here next week, right? Especially our friends from California. You're staying here, right? No, 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 no. You've got to come back again. <laughs> and hopefully we get to see our friends from online as well if you can come by if you can so this new covenant of course is confirmed by his blood and uh, and he was shed for many for the remissions of our sins so in 31 AD Jesus was crucified and what happens to the rest of the so of course we need to account for the next uh, three and a half weeks right so three and a half weeks three and a half uh, three and a half days uh, so or years what happens then, of course, when we look at the, the 31 plus 3.5, equal to what? 34 AD indeed. What happens in 34 AD? We have the first Christian martyr. The first Christian martyr, and his name is Stephen. Stephen was a deacon and was filled with the Holy Spirit. When he was called to answer for his faith, the crowds that were present rejected the message. They rejected not just Stephen, but they rejected Jesus. Stephen was trying to reveal to them their, their rebellious nature, them being a the stiff-necked people, not from that time only, but from all the way to the time of Moses, that they were a stiff-necked people. Daniel even prayed for this stiff-necked stiff people. And Stephen here is revealing to these people that they were a stiff-necked people. Did they listen? No. They gnashed their teeth. They were so filled with hatred, which gives you a sense of what the world would be like when Jesus comes. What the world would be like for those, for all of us, when Jesus comes. We need to be ready. Are we ready for that day? Are we ready for that day? But... Although it is sad to hear the fate of what happened to Stephen, the good news, irregardless from that event, was what? The gospel was sent, was, was, uh, the gospel was received by the Gentiles, okay? It was now sent out to the Gentiles. There was a, gr a great persecution towards the, Christ the Jewish Christians at that time. And as a result, the message, the gospel message was now sent to the Gentiles. Praise the Lord for that. Because if it wasn't for, well, either irregardless, God still had plans for all of us. Whether Jew or Gentile, whether free or slave, it doesn't matter. Yes, God does so love the world. God so loves us. But God also loves those people out there. So, what can we learn? Well, either way, uh, before we, we get there, that now fulfills the 70 weeks prophecy, irregardless. Now, of course, we need to account for the, the rest of the 2,300 year prophecy, but that's something that uh, my, my, my friends will, uh, will share at other times. I was gonna say predecessors, <laughs> but my friends 
My friends will share later. They're not my predecessors. <laughs> my colleagues, my colleagues will share later on. But either way, what can we learn from what has been revealed? Okay, what could we learn about God? Well, first things first, we know that God is indeed patient. 490 years? Can you wait 490 years? Well, of course, we won't exist for 490 years. But even then, not only 490 years, looking outside that, from the time of creation, you know, from, from Adam's sin to where we are now, God is indeed patient. What does that give you? What kind of character does that reveal to you about who he is? God would never abandon us. God has always been patient. Even though we live, for us, we only live 80 to 90 years on this earth, God is patient with us. We understand about, well, when it comes to God, God has a plan for salvation for all of us. God has a plan for all of us. He, he, he's, 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 um, he's revealed that at the time of creation, at the time of, oh, sorry, at the time of when, and Satan, oh, when Adam sinned. This whole idea of plan was created, was made even before we were created. It was all set. God has a plan for our salvation. God has a plan that we will be with him forever. And only, not only that, God answers prayers. That's not, did God answer Daniel's prayer? Will God answer our prayers? Indeed. You see, when, when Daniel was praying, the angel Gabriel was sent just as he was praying. God attended to Daniel by helping him understand what is to come. Now, obviously as your pastor, we need to look at Daniel. What can we learn from Daniel? Because obviously he was just a man as we are just God's beautiful creation. What in this chapter can we learn from, a great, from, from the, the prophet Daniel? Well, in the beginning of chapter, in the beginning of this chapter, what was Daniel doing? No, he wasn't praying yet. Well, obviously he was praying, but <laughs> he was praying. But the chapter, in the first part of the chapter, what was he doing? He was studying scripture. He was studying scripture, right? He was studying scripture for what purpose? To understand, for answers. How many of us have done that? How many of us have gone to the scriptures to look for answers? Lord, why, I mean, why aren't I doing well, in, uh, well at work or whatever it is? How many of us have gone to the scriptures to look for answers? How important is this? For all scripture is Inspired by God, right? Continue on. Okay. Uh, well, what else was uh, after he studied the scriptures? After he was trying to understand what was to come, what did he do next? He fasted, prayed. It all came together, right? Fasted, prayed, put sackcloth on. He prayed. And he prayed for the intercession of his people. All right? He prayed for the intercession of his people, for, uh, for understanding, uh, he prayed for the forgiveness of his people. He asked God to show favor towards his people as well. Should we be doing the same? How important is prayer in our Christian walk? It's very essential, right? Indeed. But how important is it for us to pray for each other? How I mean, it's, it's easy for us to pray for ourselves in this selfish world. But how important is it for us to pray for our friends, our brothers and sisters in the pew, our friends that are out there in the community? For they are, they are also a creation of God. Didn't God die for them as well? So how important is it for us to also think about them in bringing them to God through prayer? So... I guess like I've got the next question I was going to ask you, how often do you put a sackcloth and ashes on your head? <laughs> do you have one of those in, 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 your, in your closet somewhere? Not to ask you to, you know, punish yourself in some way, but I guess like at the same time, how sincere is your prayer for those people? Anyway, now, how long did it take for God to answer his prayer to reveal to him about the, uh, the 2,300 day prophecy? Like how long did that take? It was about what? As I mentioned, it was about nine to 10 years, right? 
Nine or ten years. Nine or ten years it took. I mean, Daniel could have... It's, it's wonderful to see that um, for Daniel, Daniel was patient with God. You know, there are many things that come in life where we ask God for, we want this, we want that. and we, Are we patient enough to, to wait for God to respond? But Daniel had to wait for nine or ten years, even longer, who knows? Nine or ten years. But God answered his prayer irregardless. And I think for most of us, we need to trust in God, trust in God's timing, and be patient like Daniel. Right? In whatever aspect. Obviously, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 means what? It says what? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Are we patient with God? We know that Jesus is coming soon. We know that we need to be patient. But in that time of patience, we need to do his work. We need to do his will. Right? We have a gospel that we need to proclaim to, to all parts of White Tara and its community. But in that patience, let us be faithful in him. We, you know, although we may be different, we have different personalities, etc., irregardless, we need to be like Daniel in these last days. Can we be like Daniel in these last days? Can we be faithful? Indeed. Let us continue to search the scriptures. Let us continue to pray for one another and let us be patient until he comes again. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we are so thankful, Lord, for this message. It's so much in this one chapter that we can reveal. But Lord, we have so little time up on the stage. But Lord, for all of us, in whatever life and uh, whatever years we have left, we have your word. And we are so thankful for your word that it'll help us, Lord, to better understand what is to come, who you are, and how we should live. We are so thankful, Lord, that your word reveals to us life. It reveals to us Jesus. We pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless us, Lord, as we journey with you. We ask and pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us in every step of the way. We know that you know what we are about to pray for. We are so thankful, Lord, that you will hear our prayer. We are so thankful, Lord, that you will never abandon us. Bless us, Lord, each Step of the way, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.